test and see how it's going and see if we can get some of the... there they are i was like what's happening all right looks like people are joining and I'm sorry, I, those of you who were on earlier and I like started it and stopped it, I think Arlene, I bumped you off too. <laughs> I was like, I didn't mean to do that. But everybody is joining. I think for today, I'm gonna just turn everybody into panelists for today in case they wanna show their screens or their videos. Getting everybody logged in. I don't see CP yet. We'll check my phone and make sure she's okay. Yeah, that's what it should be, but I wonder if the approval pathway is still through her instead of I'll help you get her to change it. Yeah, I tried. I tried to even search it and do everything. Well, and yeah, and I couldn't even find a PO number that was on the, in the picture. I'm going, well, where's the PO number? I can't look it up by the picture. Yeah, that's what it Okay, we're getting our other friend on here. Uh, Miss Sarah, I saw your name. I was going to make you and Jane co-host so that you can help me to keep promoting people. I thought if you guys want to show your videos this month, we would do that. So I just have to do, um, just have to, you know, click the settings differently. Um, all right. So um, one of our other um, presenters, she's still, she's, she's, it's the end of the day in Israel. She's stuck in traffic, which is typical for this time of day. And um, today was the first day they opened Israel back up. Uh, employees can go back to um, halftime work. So um, I guess there were, was a lot of, um, a lot of traffic there. So um, anyways, that's a little bit why we have the delay. And um, so she says she's going to pull over and do that. How are you guys doing? You should be able to unmute yourself, show your video, whatever you want to do. Maggie's giving a thumbs up. What's new? What's happening? Susie, looks like you unmuted. Uh, yes, I, I made it here, but I don't see that I have any video that says I can, uh, you know, get, I finally have a mute thing but I don't have any video. I'm sorry, you can't see me. It doesn't have a video symbol on here. Oh. Um, things, things are going pretty well here in Cleveland. Thank you. Excellent, uh, excellent. Well, yeah. we're glad to have you. Thank you. 
Looks like Angela, you're showing your video. I just like let people to know that they are doing that on purpose. I'm looking. So how how are things going in your units right now? Well, right now we don't. We only have one visitor in the unit at, at a time for mm -hmm. each baby. Um, and that's usually the mother, and, and we're not letting them change visitors unless it's a father. And no other grandparents or anybody else is allowed to visit. And uh, we're yeah. having a lot of troubles allowing kangaroo care to continue, um, even though I've shared lots of the documents and policies, especially those that have come out this last week, et cetera. Yeah. But it's just a, a battle because they still think that, you know, well, yeah. even if they're asymptomatic, you know, they can have COVID and we shouldn't even be allowing this. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, but in terms of kangaroo care per se, the argument is, oh, well, the mother will pass the back, the virus onto the baby with kangaroo care. That's not what the, um, not what the, uh, World Health Organization promotes. It's not what UNICEF promotes, but it yeah. is more in line with what CDC promotes at this point. And so I'm busy putting together an article on the immunological properties of kangaroo mother care uh, that suggests that it really has been, you know, decreases infections. That's clearly known because the mother does have the ability to develop antigen-specific antibodies very quickly. Um, and then she can pass those to the baby, as we learned in 2000 with Richard Sandler's study. So yeah. anyway, it's a lot of things going on. Yeah. Susie, will you, will you introduce yourself really quickly in case some people don't know your voice oh, like I do? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. My name is Susan Luddington, and I'm a PhD nurse midwife, certified nurse midwife, and I do all of my research in kangaroo care starting in 1980, and I've had uh, seven R01 grants for that, and I am the kangaroo researcher that really got started in America. And yep. at this so, um, at this time, and I was just asked by um, Joggin to write a national policy for kangaroo care for the nation during COVID. So that's what I'm putting all these documents together for because I just finished a national uh, guideline for the A1 group on sudden unexpected postnatal collapse of infants during kangaroo care and breastfeeding. And that should be appearing in the June issue for everyone to see. That's so awesome. I am a scientist in Cleveland at Case Western Reserve University. Welcome, welcome. Well, we were. Ex I was excited to get your email and um, Malathi, that should say a lot about how excited she is about your work and, and really she was like, how do I join? Do I have the right link? And so we um we really appreciate you being here with us and appreciate all of your work um that you do and continue to do and um, really are the pioneer for that um as well so i'm gonna let dr cp kraus here talk really quickly she's in her car pulled over on the side of the road on her way home from from technion in israel <laughs> they have reopened the country and people have gone crazy <laughs> oh yeah so hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is actually the first day that we were allowed to go back to work and that uh, the, the daycare started open gradually. So it was the first day of my kids back to the daycare. <laughs> She's four and she was so excited and I was so nervous. And so I apologize for this. I don't have this nice background as you do it's just the car background um real life so thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much kathy for inviting me um you know that i like um and and appreciate and adore everything that you do uh for these tiny little babies um and 
you know, and I told you about this initiative that we started, and I will tell the group more about it. Um, you you were so excited, and you suggested that I will tell the others about it, and yes. uh, it's definitely my pleasure. So, um, I I live in Israel. I work both in Israel at the Technion, uh, which is a university, um, and in Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And I do neuroimaging research uh, in little children. I, I look at brain development. And I know how screen exposure is not the most ideal thing, and this is an underestimate, for little kids. Uh, I research that. I look at the correlation with brain activation and brain structure, and we published several really nice papers about it recently. Um, and during COVID, obviously, everybody are so exposed to screens. I mean, we cannot avoid that. Um, and and um, grandma and grandpa are in a lockout, and they cannot uh, freely communicate with with their uh, grandkids. And they also are very nervous and anxious, um, as we all do. But I think that at this age, when the risk is high, it's even more so. And so we were thinking about um, maybe a nice way to make grandma and grandpa feel better and doing something that, doing something beneficial with their time that will also make them engage and can benefit the little kids. And so we created the greatest, the largest grandma and grandpa library. It's a virtual library where um, grandma and grandpa tell a story, record themselves in a video telling a kid's story. They can show the book. They can even ask, you know, questions and wait a little bit uh, because kids do respond when they see it, even offline. And we started doing that and spread the word. Um, we invited um basically grandma and grandpa from all over the world in any language possible to send us videos and we posted them in our website at the Technion and also in our Facebook page uh, for the lab and I think we have uh, we almost have a hundred stories told by um, oh thank you Kathy this is wonderful yeah we have lots and lots of stories everything is in the language There we go. That way you can still talk, but I'll show you. Sorry. This is, this, is, uh, this is a grandma that's really recorded a song on top of it, but you don't need to be too, so sophisticated. You can just really tell it. Yep, sorry, there we go. I think I finally muted it. I mean, you can scroll through it, and um, I have several of my friends from Cincinnati, also grandma and grandpa, that send stories in English. And I can tell you, you know, I don't think with all the technology and Zoom and all the great things no, that technology <laughs> um, I don't think that there is a replacement for human touch and human connection. But when we cannot have that, we can have something instead. This is actually the, uh, the president of Israel. He didn't participate in my specific project, but he had his own project telling stories live, and we just added it to our library so kids can enjoy it. And what happened, because we spread the word, parents just knew that if they want to have a story told to their kids, they just logged in. And they, and they just had it. And so I talked to Kathy about it and I said, well, you know, if you have a group of um, individuals that would like to contribute, that would like to be part of it, I would be more and more than happy to get these videos and to put it out there. Because I know that in the US, um, the lockout is gonna stay for a while, um, yeah. hopefully, you know, hopefully it's going to gradually go in, the curve will go down, and it's probably that's what's going to happen. But for those who are um, still afraid to leave the house and, and 
really think of good things that they can do, maybe this is one of the things that can can be, you know, it's it's an investment of your time. This is how I see it. And I had grandma and grandpas that kept, you know, kept sending me stories even <laughs> after the lockdown ended because they said, well, this is, it became part of our routine and we like to do that so much. Oh. So this is an open invitation. Um, if you want to do something like that, um, Kathy can share my email and I yes. would be more than happy to include you. And if you just want to go in and see how grandpa and grandma are telling stories in Hebrew yeah. or in English, you're more than welcome to do so. Yeah, they're, they're lovely, right? I mean, I think this is a really good example of how simple it can be. You know, exactly. like really point, just like if you were there, right? Like, do you see this? And it's really what you taught us um, when you were with us is just how much our expressions mean and um, that interplay that we, we can do. So um, I don't wanna keep you from, from getting home, but I had one more little video I wanted to show and I wanted, we wanted to get your opinion about this. And then also yeah. Malafi um, is a neonatologist and her team is with us. And um, she was just telling me also about the reading program they're doing, which I thought you would love to hear about. Um, they're, they're doing amazing things. So um, let me show this quick video of this grandmother singing to her baby. For me. very young and try to imitate, uh, at, you know, Dr. Andrews at the University of Washington in 84 demonstrated to all of us how they would learn to stick out their tongue if they saw you and if they see your mouth move and go, ah, oh, they will imitate this. And I don't know if she's got it in sync with the song or something, but whatever you see, she's yeah. thoroughly enjoying it. And I'm thinking thoroughly. of all the beautiful theta waves going on in her EEG <laughs> that say, this is a wonderful time I'm having. Exactly. So our question really to you, CP, is really, what about wearing these masks all day in our interactions with babies? Yes, we are all wearing masks. Oh, sorry. There you are, Susie. Uh, well, we're wearing, wearing masks and we even have masks for the babies. You have that mask for the babies? babies? Yes, uh-huh. We have lots really? of little masks made for us by a local group for the babies too. Wow. Everybody's wearing masks. The, the big issue is we're not social distancing. And I just keep reminding everybody, you know, this is very important for the baby's development and recovery. Separation is toxic stress to these babies. And yeah. you are only encouraging complications of COVID rather than recovery if in babies who happen to be positive, if we don't allow the mother to be nearby and hold her baby. You know, everybody thinks rooming in is no longer, you know, separation. No, if the baby's not in contact with the mother, that is separation. So CP, what can we do? Well, go ahead CP. <laughs> talking to me I'm, <laughs> I'm still overwhelmed by these gestures and faces and, and and facial expression this is just amazing I think that uh continue talking to the baby even if we're if the parents are wearing a mask 
the eyes mm-hmm. are one of the most um, triggering um, um, stimula- stimulators for the child. Uh, yeah. We are wired, our brain is wired to look for eyes, you know. You are, yes, you're very right about the eyes and they can see those. And we do know from the work being conducted in Boston that singing one consistent lullaby that, to a baby is does two things. It really reduces their stress well. Well, it does three. Actually, one reduces stress. Two, it starts to set their circadian rhythm pattern. That means that, you know, when I hear this lullaby, which maybe comes right after feeding, then I go off to sleep. And the third thing it does is it encourages dialect, you know, and a dialogue between the mother and the baby, whether that is a behavioral dialogue before it's also accompanied by language, or whether it's just vocalization dialogue that later becomes accompanied by behavior. Excellent. Um, so Malati, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Correct. Hi, everyone. I'm Malati. I'm one of the neonatologists. I work in Northern California, um, El Camino and Stanford. Um, it's been great honor to be joining this group and I'm so excited to share our work and I just wanted to share our reading program. Um, so we started doing this reading program in February of this year. So we just included um, anybody, used to be parents and grandparents. Now we have a visitor a limitation of like only allowing abandoned parents to um, come to our unit. So both mom and dad can come and uh, not the grandparents. Um, so they are reading to the babies and nurses too. So we did, we have eight of our shifts. So we are doing a 10 minutes per shift of reading to babies and the nurses are actually logging that. So we are tracking that minutes, how many minutes the babies, um, babies are read and it's just the way of uh, tracking that and making sure we are um, improving our um, exposure, okay. language exposure. So it's been going well so far. So hopefully I can present to this group next year. So our data and so we are excited and that video is like so amazing to see. Yeah, even the Gravens conference they presented, you, you can see this direct vocal contact as early as 32 weeks. And so the babies, they just look at you and then whenever you have this uptone and then the tone of the voice that actually stimulate and encourage them to have this direct uh, contact. So that's great to see that video. Thanks for sharing that. Kathy. Yeah, for sure. I'll put it up in, in our group as well. So CP, I know you need to get wow. back on the road. I appreciate you so much for taking time and Pleasure. And, and that program that was just described sounds absolutely amazing. I have so many questions. Maybe we can, I can ask them offline. But, you know, is it during kangaroo? Is it while the child is in the, uh, in the bassinet or in, its, uh, or, or in bed? Like, is it while the parent is touching the child, which I think is extremely important? Um, and how exactly you're tracking it? How, how do you measure the before and after and the outcome? What exactly is measured? Yes. So this is extremely interesting. I'm happy to talk to you offline. Yes, definitely. Kathy can connect us so we can chat more. Yes. My favorite Thank thing to do is to connect like-minded people. <laughs> Amazing. It's my superpower. It's the only one I have. <laughs> Well, excellent. Thank well, you're you so welcome much. to stay on as long as you want um, to be safe while you're driving. And then um, I think we'll allow the team from El Camino to, to jump on and to jump in because we are really excited about this. And you can tell from the attendee list, even live today, people are really excited to hear more about what you guys are doing. I was so excited when I heard this presentation at Graven. And, um, and really, I'm excited you guys are here. And so I'll let you introduce yourself and the team. And then you, I know you have some slides for us as well. Okay. All right. So you can share my screen. Bye, CP. If you have to go, we love you. Thank you so much. Me too. Bye bye. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just. Uh, 
Really glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us, Kathy. So we have our team member here, and uh, Arlene is our one of the nurse champions and leader of this great project. Um, so she is going to present with me. And I think I saw Maggie is from our unit too. So she is joined and I'm not sure if anybody else from our unit is joined. And thank you for all you do. Uh, it's fantastic um, a place for us to share our um, project. And so the first slide I'm presenting, it's the perfect time to share the kangaroo care um, story. So in two days, that's on Friday, it's a kangaroo care day, National Kangaroo Care Day. Um, so everybody is like the COVID is separating us. I think we are trying to reunite and kind of connect these parents by doing this kangaroo care day. So I just wanted to fish out for that. And so this um, project is the quality improvement effort to improve um, or out of the box. We came up with this terminology because not only is promoting the skin to skin contact, it's as well as the swaddle hold. And I'm um, sorry, I will explain to you more about why we picked and what are the benefits of the swaddle hold. Um, so it was done in a community level pre-NICU. So I'm a Stanford faculty. We uh, work at the community El Camino Hospital. So it's a community level three NICU. And and um, so, next slide. So these are all our co-authors. Um, so you can see there's a nurse educator, a nurse, nursing staff, and neonatologists are part of this uh, project and um, successful. Um, it, it turned out to be a great success. And we are still uh, working, doing this project as a sustainable period. So you can see our data. Um, so we don't have any conflict of disinterest or nothing to disclose. Um, so what are the learner objectives? The conclusion of this activity, you're able to recognize the physiologic response to stress and how the skin to skin care as a stress reducing activity. And also you can recognize the importance of developing a standardized skin to skin care in every NICU. I know every unit is spending time to doing the skin to skin care, but it's unless if you track or unless you measure, so you don't know if you are doing it well or is there any area you want to improve. So that's the next thing we wanted to um, take the um, home message from the, after this talk and also overcome some of the barriers. Um, 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 they learn the concept of uh, out of the box and what are the benefits of it and new ways of tracking time. Um, it's not only skin to skin, also the swaddle hold and uh, we are tracking the reading um, time. So all those things by creating the flow sheet and the electronic health record. So this slide is a courtesy of Dr. Major from Nationwide Hospital. Um, so she um, showed us this slide in the Gravens Conference. So this is the great way of looking at this. Um, so fetal development uh, of uh, onset of sensory system. So they start with this touch and vestibular is when the mom is walking and it's surrounded by the amniotic fluid. So they have this mobility and then the auditory function develops and then visual function. So all these things are disrupted by um, come delivering early and having the NICU experiences, uh, doing multiple procedures and immobility, exposing to the atypical loud sound and atypical brightness. All these things contribute to this, their sensory um, somato sensation um, differences. So the little backgrounds, uh, infants and in NICU exposed to many sources of stress, as you all know. For example, average infants in the NICU experience 10 painful procedures per day. The physiologic responses to stress as critical implications for short-term and long-term outcomes for infants in NICU. So this is the um, di um, flow diagram. It's uh, showing mammalians the response to stress situation. So when we expose to this low stress for environment, then hypothalamus is secreting this oxytocin hormone. Everybody says we love hormone, so it's a, it's a good thing. But when, in contrast, when we have this exposed to the high stress environment, the hypothalamus is producing the first level response, activation of a sympathetic nervous system, fight and fight response. And, and also activate this as vagal, Nerve. So the vagal nerves are two components. One is the dorsal motor nucleus. The other one is the ventral motor nucleus. Ventral motor nucleus is the very um, positive things for the babies to have. The dorsal motor is the unmyelinated my vagus nerve. Whenever they stimulate the vagus nerve, then they have this apnea, Brady, disengagement, and hypotonia. 
Um, so this is the expansion of this high stress response that would happen if there is a sympathetic nervous system stimulator, uh, this epinephrine and norepinephrine release, which causes all this um, um, uh, consequences of a somatic growth inhibited and also neurodevelopmental abnormalities and poor growth and increased inflammatory markers and uh, such, uh, which is not a great thing for the babies to have. So in con Response, the oxytocin is causing this myelinated vagus um, stimulation. That's the nucleus ambiguous. It causes the myelinated vagus nerves to be stimulated. Then we add this all positive things. They have a better cues, better engagement with parents and feeding. And also, there's no sign of reflux and improved enteral feeding tolerance, improved digestion, and probably growth. <laughs> Um, so how do we, what is the connection between this um, oxytocin and skin-to-skin -skin care? In animal models, the oxytocin is released in newborns when they're exposed to this tactile stimulation, warm temperature, and massage of the abdomen. All these things can be achieved by doing this skin-to-skin -skin -skin care. When mom is holding or any parents is holding, so they have this skin-to-skin like, -skin contact, warm temperature, and then the massaging of the abdomen, the way they do their holding, that actually causing them to stimulate, increase the oxytocin release. And studies found that 60 minutes of skin-to-skin -skin resulted in increased salivary oxytocin levels in mothers, fathers, and infants too, and decreased the infant salivary cortisol level, which is the stress hormone, so which is also decreased by doing the skin-to-skin -skin care. Another study showed every additional 10 minutes of skin-to-skin -skin care, oxytocin increasing by 17%. Um, so it's like very dose-dependent response. So if you have this every additional 10 minutes, then your oxytocin level is increasing and which causes the benefit of uh, oxytocin related, all the benefits that I showed in the previous slides. So in a summary, so it's got both infants and parents, they get these benefits. And so the infants, it's stability of temperature. They don't have this uh, desaturation episodes and uh, stabilizing the cardiorespiratory rhythms and improves their sleep cycles. And also it provides the anesthesia during painful procedure. And in Colombia, the country Colombia, where this um, kangaroo care was discovered, so the 20-year follow-up study was done, they noticed uh, um, so infants in a skin-to-skin -skin care group had a less aggressive drive and were less impulsive and hyperactive compared to the control group. So it's long-lasting effect. It's not only stop in the infant's time period, it's even after 20 years down the road, it's a beneficial. For parents, and it's improved their bonding and helps stimulate maternal lactation, and it's better adaptation by the parents with respect to the birth of the premature infant. Um, so how do we come up with the swaddle hold? Okay, so everybody knows skin to skin is great, and the swaddle hold is this, um, article it was in a parent magazine, Arlene, our nurse champion, she actually showed me this and science proves you can't hold your baby too much. There is no such thing as holding your babies, you're spoiling your babies um, by holding too much. So I wanted to look at the study um, to dive and then see what exactly they looked at it. So it was published in Current Biology in 2017 by Nationwide Children's Hospital Group, and they looked at this um, touch exposure and then infant brain. Um, so they included 125 preterm and term infant, and basically they looked at their EEG and event-related potential, and they come up with the conclusions that premature babies were more likely to have a reduced response to touch than full-term babies. And premature babies also who had an increased amount of gentle touch from their parents or caregivers, actually they responded more strongly with the gentle touch than the premature babies who were in touch or held. So that's the conclusion of this paper is like it provide this preterm babies um, positive supportive touch such as skin to skin or even swaddle hold by parents. So another paper was published in 2013 um, by this um, nursing group. They looked at the um, holding practice on preterm infant development. 
They randomized to three groups. They did the skin to skin, blanket hold, and control group between 32 to 35 weeks and 25 weeks in each group. Um, they enrolled less than a month old. And uh, so mother recorded a time held daily. And they looked at the preterm behavior, infant behavior at 40 and 44 weeks. What they found was that the skin to skin care and blanket hold groups had more optimal scores than in control group in robust crying, which is a uh, rose to vigorous crying and calming down. So with all proves that so any positive touch, it's a swaddle hole, a containment hole, or skin to skin is beneficial for the babies. Um, so this is overall, uh, what are the positive things that we can achieve by a touch response? So somatic sensation is a critical to development of social and cognitive and motor domains. Um, so also if any disruption of the processing created with the ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. And painful procedures in the NICU are associated with the altered brain microstructure and their stress hormone levels are increased, which causes the poorer um, cognitive, motor, and behavior neurodevelopment. And also this, um, this is a very um, in, interesting and uh, unfortunate thing um, to hear. The surgical and the NICU procedures associated with the increased threshold to hot and cold, and also they have this uh, sense, uh, called this a dysesthesia. The touch feels very painful for those babies when they're exposed to this uh, surgical procedure without having any positive touch response uh, during that procedure. So um, the Conclusion of this background is the best practice is a kangaroo care. We have to be as soon as possible for as long as possible and as un uninterrupted as possible. Um, so that's the take home message we got after attending the Gravens conference in 2019. Um, so this is the, uh, the picture of our uh, nursing champion. Um, so who we'll lead this project and uh, so make this um, successful. So I will hand over this to Erlene. So she's going to describe how we um, implemented this, what are the barriers, and, and then I will come back and talk about our data. Erlene? Okay. You can go ahead in the next slide. So as Malthy said, um, I started the, we started this project after the Gravens um, conference. We um, prioritized looking at things that we can improve in our environment for these high-risk um, infants. Um, one of the takeaways I had from the Gravens conference was a percentage that was given at, um, for one of the lectures. And when a baby is in mom, um, a baby is in contact, contact with his mother 98% of the time. Um, when you look at the percentages around the world, in Europe and in Stockholm, um, babies are in contact with their mothers 65% of the time. But when we look at the United States, um, we actually only average about 10% of the time. And that's in the best NICUs. Um, for the most part, it's about 5% of the time. So that really hit me. And, um, and I looked at our unit with skin to skin, you know, yes, we're getting the babies out, but you know, we still had um, some issues with how long they're out. Um, and then another you know, priority for starting this was we're actually in the process of a remodel and going to um, private rooms. And so our family involvement and family skin to skin and family holding is going to be more, more important as we move into these private rooms. Um, go ahead, now the next slide. So we um, formed our um, group, um, as she uh, showed you in the beginning, so with doctors, nurses, and we came up with two goals. Um, our first goal was um, to provide skin to skin for all infants less than 35 weeks within the first 48 hours of life. Um, we were actually doing a pretty good job with that, but what we were missing was our micro preemies. And so we pulled up a lot of literature and looked at that and we wanted to improve them and make sure that our micro preemies um, that have lines and humidity and all that were also being held in the first 48 hours to get those benefits. And then we also wanted to improve the time that our um, grower, as we call grower feeders are being held. Um, and we wanted to improve that by 20%. Um, um, so how did we do it? Go ahead. Um, so some of the things we needed to do is we needed a way to tra track it. Um, so we um, worked with IT department and we set up our electronic health record to have a tab in Epic that is kind of, we call the tab our family center care tab. 
Um, on that tab, we have, you know, when the doctors talk with the families, when the families come in and provide care, there's a way to chart that. There's the vocal part of it, so we can track our talking, our reading, our singing. Um, and then, of course, we added the skin to skin and swaddle holding um, section. So um, that was important to get that started. Um, next slide. The next thing I had to look at is how was I going to educate the staff? Um, and you know, that's definitely a you know, how hard to do when you're on a budget. Um, so we came up with a display board um, and then we had a sign off sheet where the, um, everybody had to sign that they looked at the board. On it, we had information about what are the positive effects. Um, we had on there what percentage we were at, which we were actually higher than the 10%. So we were excited where we started in our baseline. Um, we also had to look at how we were going to prioritize how we were going to get these micro preemies out. We wanted to standardize it so we were all doing the same thing. We all knew our roles. So our team, Michelle, Michelle, and I got together with the RT department and we mocked it out. We got a, a doll and we pretended it had all its lines in it and a ventilator and we started role playing it. So we found a way to um, keep the baby's head midline. Um, and transfer it to mom and in a midline position hold. Um, and then once we did that, that was on the board and it kind of showed pictures, but we were fortunate enough also to have skills day um, right afterwards. So we were able to also in skills day demonstrate it to the nurses. Um, and then kind of right after we started this program, we were kind of fortunate that we had a slew of micro preemies that came into our unit. And um, Malfi, a little bit later, we'll show you the data on how well we did with those. We needed to develop a parent handout. Um, this is a handout that we give to our families when they first come in that explains the importance of skin to skin because we all know that our parents are frightened. They feel their babies are very fragile and that they're going to break. Um, and so we tried to have them read this so that they feel a little bit more comfortable before they come in for their first skin to skin. We're currently working also in getting it in a Spanish version since we have a um, big Spanish population. And then along with this, um, next slide, we needed, we wanted a, um, a gift certificate to show that um, that, that first held was done. Um, I noticed the first month I wasn't seeing a lot of these certificates up at the bedsides, even though the data was showing that the babies were being held. So what I did is I actually just sent an email out to the doctors and had them become champions. There's less of them and it's easier for me to reach them and have them be champions. So they became champions reminding the nurses at the bedside um, to get, you know, from these from the file cabinet and, and hand them to the families and then put up the certificate once the held was done. Um, another way I did it is just my champions in my unit. Um, when we notice a new baby comes into the unit, I'll just go put the papers at the bedside or, you know, Michelle will put the papers at the bedside as a reminder to that nurse that we want the baby held in the first 48 hours. Um, the next slide, this is just a diagram again showing that process from A to D that I've been talking about, but the, kind of the biggest takeaways I can say is, um, you know, that it has made us successful in this program is um, partnering with leadership, you know, going in, meeting with leadership, letting them know what your plans are. Um, you know, they, we might be surprised. There might be some budget hidden somewhere that can help support this. Um, if there's no budget, um, recruit champions that just believe in it. One of um, my co cohorts in this, Michelle, she's had preemies in the NICU herself. Um, so she's a big cohort for, you know, promoting this program because she, you know, she knows how important it was with her girls. Um, working with the IT department, you know, there, there's maybe a champion in there that can help you in setting up um, the flow sheets. Um, and then if you're limited budget or no budget, another way, like at our hospital, if you're a CM3, um, you have to belong with projects and you have to work on projects. So pulling in those people as your resources to help you um, start the project. And then another important thing is just look outside your unit. Um, look at your hospital. Are there hospital committees? Is there a family committee at your hospital? Um, do they have protocols already written to help you with this? Um, and then your volunteers, um, you know, there's volunteer committees, you know, right now they can't come into the hospital. So if you're looking to start this over this next year with the COVID, you know, maybe they could help make 
you know, display items for you at home and, and then you pick them up. So um, another thing I would say is just looking outside your um, unit. Um, so we're going to go back to Melfi and she'll kind of go over some of the data we found. So this is a slide that we did the graven stock this uh, year. So yeah. So as Arlene mentioned, so we have this electronic health record um, with flow sheets. And so the nurses are documenting. As you see, this is in a range of the minutes documentation. So when we are collecting the data, we needed to know the actual minutes. So it came up with this um, idea of like, if there is a range, so I picked some um, middle number. So if they spent zero to 15 minutes uh, for holding, then I come up with this 10 minutes as the um, average arbitrarily picked some um, number for each range. Um, so then we added all the minutes per day for that baby for their entire stay and divide that by the provides the average minutes per day for that baby during their hospital stay. Um, so that gives us the um, how many how long they held and so that's the entire hospital um, course that we can get that baby's um, held time. So this is our demographic data. So we looked at the baseline data. So we looked at the baseline for the first skin to skin for 12 months. So we had a 90 babies in that categories. And so intervention was six months. We started this project July, um, July of 2019. And we ended in December 2019. It's a six months time period was our intervention time period. So we had a 32 babies and we wanted to look at this um, small, less than 30 weeker and then more bigger than 30 weeker. Um, so gestational age, we went as low as the lowest gestation was 24 and three weeker, and then intervention time was 27 and six weeker. And we are continuing analyzing this uh, project by doing the sustainable period for a one year. Um, so it started in January of 2020. So this is the ongoing data collection. We have the smallest baby in the sustainable period was 26 weeker. Um, so this is the graph. Graph. Um, so whenever we are looking at any quality improvement project, and instead of showing the bar graph, it's a way of uh, um, way of showing displaying our data in a different format. It's a control chart. Um, so this one is the X chart. Um, so there's a QI macro software. So I just uh, use that to analyze our data. So the x-axis, you have the different time period in a quarterly, and then y-axis, you have hours of life. Um, so the, as you can see, the baseline, the middle line is the control limit, that's the average. So baseline was average 42 hours. So we are actually doing pretty good with our baseline data too. So pretty much average, our babies held within 42 hours. But some, some of the babies, they were micropremies or um, so some reason they were not held in 48 hours time period. So it ranges from anywhere 300 to 500 hours of life. So that's the reason we wanted to narrow this um, upper control limit and lower control limit. We started this project. As you can see, the several um, interventions made during this time period. Um, so as Arlene mentioned, so we did all this, created the subcommittee, put, put the poster and standardized the transfer. So we were able to bring down this um, control limit down to nine hours during the intervention time period. So all the babies, uh, they held within 48 hours. And uh, so the control limit went down to nine hours. Um, so then this starting January, so our control limit went up a little bit. It's a 28 hours because we had uh, three micro uh, preemies and they were an oscillator. Um, so though we provided the containment hold, and since we are looking at the skin to skin, I, have, I didn't include that data. Um, so the three babies, they were held outside the 48 hours window. So one was 50 hours, the other one was like 500 hours. So they were an oscillator. Um, so that's the reason. Um, so we, um, we have this uh, higher um, control limit of 28 hours and still doing great. And it's the, the way of looking at this entire baby population that actually tells us where we are and how we can uh, improve um, our care. So then I wanted to look at this less than 30 weeker. So the 30 weekers first time skin to skin. Um, so we had um, the baseline of 174 hours. Um, they were um, the first um, skin to skin was done 174 hours of life. So which went down to 82 hours of life. Um, so which is uh, significantly um, better um, compared to the baseline. 
and 30 to 35 weeker, the same 20 hours was the baseline um, average. And we were able to bring down to the 13 hours um, average. So when we have this arrow pointing down, that, that's our goal of bringing this control limit lower. Um, so which is at least ongoing data collection. So hopefully we can bring this further down. So then the next aim was, as you, um, Eric, if you recall, the early mention is a 20% increase of out-of-the-box time. So we looked at the baseline data of six months. Um, so we had 37 babies, um, less than 35 weeker, and then intervention period was six months and 29 um, um, babies in that category. Um, so here is the control chart looking at the X chart and then X axis is the time and then Y axis is the minutes and average control limit is 89.5. So that's close to 90 hours um, the babies were held um, um, out of the box. Out of the box hours the baseline. So we were created 20% above that baseline was 110 minutes was our goal. So as you can see, our goal is improved significantly increased to 156 hours, which is a 75% above our goal. Um, so our goal was like 20% and we were able to reach up to 75% increase of out of the box minutes per day. So I wanted to look at this, what are, what are we doing with the skin to skin care alone, not including the swaddle hold. Um, so the baseline data for the skin to skin was 47, um, uh, 47 minutes per day um, average, the babies have been held skin to skin. So 20% above is a goal of 57 minutes. Um, so as you can see, we are above this goal. So we were able to improve our minutes, um, the babies held skin to skin, which was 68. A minute, but you can see still several babies they were spending below our goal. Um, so then, when we're looking at the data, so I noticed, um, so because of the parental preference, and so they wanted to do the swaddle hold um, when the babies are older and bigger. Um, so they make they wanted to treat this as a normal baby, so they don't want it to do the skin to skin, and so they prefer the swaddle hold. That's the um, reason, so we are still seeing below this um, goal for individual babies, though the average is increased, but still below the goal. So what we achieved by doing this project? So all babies received a first skin to skin within 48 hours during intervention phase. And so during sustainability period, we have three babies um, not held within 48 hours, and I'm confident enough that we can, um, we can successfully uh, overcome that um, this year. And our mean um, for initial skin to skin for less than 35 weeker, the baseline was 42 to decrease to nine hours and during the sustainability period at 28 hours, so which is a, um, a great um, success. And also we achieved our goal of out of the box time, 75% um, increase and skin to skin time, 45% increase overall. So this is our kangaroo care um, day, uh, the decoration in our unit. And I would just uh, um, ask Arlene to talk about the barriers for implementing this project. And uh, we'd be happy to take any questions after this um, talk. Thank you. So when we looked at the barriers, um, of course, I think the barriers for our, yeah, most of the NICUs, um, including ours, is just the education of staff, you know, how to go about that. You know, again, I was fortunate that I had skills day um, but, you know, poster boards, um, a display board in your break rooms, bathrooms, you know, tip sheets in bathrooms, um, YouTube videos. So if you're training on how to do transfer, you can find all kinds of YouTube videos on that. Um, swaddle baths, you know, there's a lot of um, videos that have been made by um, NICUs around the country that you can pull from YouTube. Um, and then handouts, putting um, information in, in people's boxes um, that are updating. And, um, and it's, I, I find that um, if you do it kind of monthly, um, that um, you get the buy-in a little bit better because as you start seeing more improvement and then they get a new tip of why we're doing it, it just excites them and they wanna you know, do it more and more, offer it more and more. Um, the time lag of creating your flow sheet can be a barrier if you're trying to track it. Um, and I, you know, if that's not a possibility, um, I'm in a few minutes, I'm going to show up my, show you my resources. So get your cameras ready, because I'll hold up a little sheet that you guys can take a picture of that has some of the resources that I use. But um, one of the resources had a way that you could manually track it. Um, and we do have some things that we're manually tracking in our unit 
for family center care. And so a couple of our night nurses track it for us at night. So it's another way to do it. Um, again, getting information, um, new information out can be a barrier um, um, as far as the do documentation, you know, uh, it's common as for nurses just to say, you know, I'm already doing so much, I don't have time to charge to. Um, but once you kind of, if you can organize it in a way that, you know, it's like one stop shopping, I think once we had the family center care flow sheet and everybody opens it up and you just can go through that whole thing, it helps the charting kind of take off. We also put a little cute reminder on the computers, um, just this little baby coming out of the box and said, did you chart your out of the box, um, you know, data today? Um, and then I think, you know, a barrier that we all have and we will always have is just breaking our traditional beliefs. You know, I've been a NICU nurse for 30 years and I was bought in that you don't disrupt a baby during their feeding cycle. You know, if they're sleeping, let them sleep. And, um, you know, one of the things I kind of just say to nurses is like, well, if your baby was at home and grandma had just walked in the door and they're swaddled in their blanket, wouldn't you pick them up to hand them to grandma for grandma to hold? Um, so, you know, just trying to break those beliefs. Ways that you can do that is your champions. Um, if I see a family come in sitting at the bedside um, and it's not my assignment, it doesn't mean I can't offer to get that baby out. So I'll just, you know, hey, Kathy, I see your family sitting at the bedside. Can I get the baby out to hold until feeding time? Um, we swallow our babies in the isolate, um, so that way it's easy to get the babies out. Rather than using the um, positioning aids, we've gone kind of to swaddling as soon as we can. Um, another way I do it is when I have families in my assignment, um, I will teach them to become independent, um, get their own babies out of the crib, get their own babies out of the isolate. Yes, we do. Had a lot of pushback with that, with nurses saying, you know, they can't get babies out of isolate, you know. And I, I allow, we allow that, we're not gonna change, the, you know, if that, if that nurse feels safe getting the baby out themselves. Um, but it's funny how it's taken off as they start seeing more parents become independent. And in reality, we're gonna need that when we go to the private rooms, because I won't be in the room all the time when the parents are in there. So, um, you know, just giving that, the parents the autonomy and the, the reason why we want the baby held. You know, I talk to them a lot about you know, the baby was getting all the senses when they were inside of you. They were getting touch, smell, taste, hearing, movement. And in the box, they're not getting any of that. So get them out, hold them, offer them those senses, and that will help with brain development. Um, and then just um, having, again, those tips. So when I, you see weaknesses or things that aren't working, that's what I'll focus my teaching and my tip sheet on um, for the month. Um, for the families. Um, ongoing work, um, um, one of the things you could see, we're still struggling a little bit with the micro preemies. Um, so I found out that UC Davis actually holds infants on um, high frequency ventilators. Um, I've gotten some pictures, so that's one of the projects I wanna work on this next year is working on transferring a baby that's on a high, um, uh, on a high frequency ventilator. Um, improving our documentation again, just those reminders and, and rewarding the nurses for documentation and, and for holding babies. So we, I established like a, a Starbucks gift card. And so Malthy was able to track some of my data for me so I could see which nurses were actually in the beginning documenting the most and holding the most. So I would give, give certificates to those staff and I would advertise that in the unit that I had just given that gift certificate to them. Um, one, at one point I noticed that, you know, the babies that were bottle fed were getting extended holds. So they were being held longer than their bottle feeding. And, and so typically they would be held with their bottle and their gavage feeding by the nurses, but the gavage baby only were not being pulled out. So then I started giving gift certificate or Starbucks cards to those nurses that were, um, had the highest percentage of holding infants during gavage feeds. And then I caveat that and I just remind nurses that, you know, there is days that you have that assignment that you can't hold the babies and it's totally understandable. Um, but there is days that we can't hold our infants and that, you know, we may need to make that a priority. And I, it's, it's neat to see that when I walk through the unit, sometimes I'll just see like Maggie, who's on today, she, you know, I'll walk by and she's got a baby on, in her hands and she's there at the computer documenting with her right hand and she's got the baby in her left hand. Um, 
And then just looking at other ways to improve it, um, tying it, I, I thought about it when we talked about the reading program, is like tying it into other programs. Because with the reading program right now, I am noticing that when I walk through the unit, there's nurses that are sitting there reading to the babies, but the baby's still in the crib. So maybe that will be one of the focuses I put up this next month or so is that, you know, let's pick up the baby and read to them. And then maybe, and then working on um, trying to provide positive contact during painful procedures is um, some ongoing work we'd like to um, expand to. Um, let me, um, those take home messages are pretty much, we've kind of gone through all of those. Um, what I want to do is if you can make me Kathy the big screen, I just want to pop this up. You go uh, ahead and um, I think if we stop sharing our video, you can, yeah, it'll be bigger. And then for those of you watching, you can click the button that says speaker view. And as long as you're talking, Arlene, it'll make you big. Oh, so go to me. Yeah, it's it. Yep. It's so each individual will have to do it. Oh, nice. Did it we, work? Yeah. Do you also have this um, as I can, a document? I can email it out. Yeah, well, I'll just send it to you and email it out. But Perfect. the one the one thing I can just say this this um, this if you just Google the, the um, kangaroo challenge, um, Sunnybrook Hospital. They actually have a kit. Um, they do a challenge every May from January 1st to the 15th where they um, are trying to promote skin to skin in their unit and increase their time. And they've even had challenges with other hospitals, but they have a wonderful kit that you can download to your computer. And it has lots of valuable teaching information for staff, for family, for parents. I have to say most of my ideas came from that website. And then I had, there's the other, there's two other websites that also have some kits. So um, yeah, we'll send that out. And then on the bottom, I have just um, another article that talked about um, children up to age 20 and what the NICU environment does to them and, and, and ways that we need to start improving that. So um, yeah, we'll send that out. I'm sorry I didn't have it made in the slide. Um, no, it's fine. We have ways to talk to all these people. Don't worry. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I love this presentation. I loved it when I saw it in Florida. I'm so happy that you were able to come and share it. And there have been lots and lots of questions. Um, so it, do you want to just unmute yourself if you ask a question? If you don't feel comfortable or you're in a noisy place, I can read the questions as well. So um, anybody want to, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Susie, do you want me to unmute you? Oh, she's talking. She's not. Let's see. Let me find you. Um, could we please see the email for Dr. Malasi again? That went by so quickly, I couldn't get anything after Stanford. Sure. And then, um, I actually texted. Yeah, I texted to everyone my email and early email in the chat box. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I would appreciate the question that was asked if we could get some of the slides, uh, especially because I'd like some of these references. There's one in particular I didn't know about, so I wanted to um, be sure I could tap into that. And I'm so thrilled to see this out of the box challenge and uh, program. It's just really wonderful. I, but I had a comment I would like to make about one of the barriers that was identified by Arlene, which was to break the belief that um, you shouldn't interrupt a baby who is sleeping because you'll disrupt the sleep cycles. And having a 60 minute sleep cycle is absolutely perfect because all of the our EEG studies clearly showed the sleep cycle in our preemies and up to 52 weeks post-conceptional age is one hour long. And we have five publications under Ludington Ho and my grant that I got from NIH looking at sleep. And you have to remember that sleep in kangaroo care is like 10 times better than sleep not in kangaroo care better than swaddled sleep in, in the incubator. And we used a design of three hours from one feeding bef to the next before we put them in kangaroo care. Then they had a feeding in kangaroo care and they had another three hours. And then we watched them again for three hours back in the 
incubator afterwards. And we followed this randomized control trial up with doing the kangaroo care this way from 30 of uh, 36 to 40 weeks. And of course, all of our findings in over five publications showed that the sleep quality was much more superb than what you get anytime they're in a box. And in terms of, for example, discriminating state, you don't have an indiscriminate state when they're in kangaroo care. And that the quality of the EEG record during deep quiet sleep was fantastic and the duration of it as well as the quality. We clearly showed in two other articles, brain maturation is much faster with the kangaroo care sleep. The complexity of the brain as it develops with kangaroo care sleep far exceeds that, what that occurs in any other type of sleep. And that the, and not just complexity, but it was the, um, com the connectivity that we also examined that was so much better. And really, by the time the babies were 40 weeks, they had better brain development than any term infant. And that was a two week advanced brain maturation with just an hour and a half to three hours per day of kangaroo care for five days a week. And you'll find these under Ludington Ho and all of my colleagues as in pediatric neurology. And I wanted to really comment how thrilled I am to see that your out of the box quality improvement project is using the shoe heart charts with upper and lower control levels, because this is a very fine way to be evaluating what is happening, especially with quality improvement project. And I was very pleased to see that and looking forward to the publication tremendously. They, it's such a wonderful idea. I learned so very much, but I'm hoping that we can get a copy of the slides and particularly of the references. <coughs> because <coughs> as a researcher, those are the ones that thrill me. You. Can you send me a picture yeah. and I'll forward it out? One of those. Great, thank you. One of the exciting things that just demonstrates the buy-in from the families, um, I had a 28-week primary kind of that I was assigned a lot the first month, and I was talking a lot to the parents about skin to skin, and they had another child at home, and they, you know, just trying to find time to come in, and I said, well, you can do them back to back, you don't have to, and literally, I was then off for two weeks, and I came back, had the assignment, and it was so funny, because dad would come, he came in for his feeding, he held the whole three hours till the next feeding, and then I said, okay, do you want me to get the baby back for mom? And he said, no, you, we, we started changing the baby's diaper on me. And then you'll hold the baby and put the baby on mom. And I was just like, I had a tear in my eye. Cause I, I was just like, okay, so we're holding for six hours. Oh, that's great. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. Um, some of the other questions, um, if anybody's going to unmute, go, go for it. I'll just plow ahead with a few of them. You said early, oh yeah, go ahead, Angela. Um, so one of the barriers that we have is while we swaddle the babies inside the isolate, um, cause we, we track one of our like metrics for the year is skin to skin. And, um, one of the things that I think is our barrier is that we put clothes on the baby in the isolate. How did that affect you guys? And how did you get over that barrier? Because it's like, oh, I don't want to take off their outfit or, you know, because parents like having that kind of um, that bonding moment with dressing their baby in that normalcy. So is there anything that you can suggest for that? So what, what we kind of just talk with the families is that I, I, our goal is to get them to come in at any time, not just feeding time. You know, usually they would come in feeding time for skin to skin. Um, so come in anytime you're available here. And then if they walk in, it's in between, we'll pull them out swaddled. And then when it's feeding time, we put them back in the isolate, the parents undress them, do their vitals, do their diaper, get them ready for skin to skin. And then we bring them back out again for skin to skin. Mm -hmm. We kind of have both um, going on. Okay, so the swaddled while their feeding's going on, if they come well, in between. No, the swaddle is in between. So the feeding yep. time is nine o'clock, they came in at eight. Uh, rather than sitting there at the bedside waiting till skin to skin, we get them out swaddled. And yeah. it doesn't, so it doesn't, and we just get them out. Then parents hold rocks. That's when they do their reading. And, and we'll, feeding time's nine o'clock. Then we put them back in the isolate to do the skin to skin. Parents take their clothes off, that kind of thing. So. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh -huh. I thought it was a really great tip, Arlene, about the just swaddling more and kind of that transition out of the um, positioning aids to make that easier to do. I mean, and just almost to prompt you, like you said, like if those opportunities come, how quick you could just do it. Yeah, yeah. Or um, the parents can become independent. Go ahead. Or the parents can become independent. You know? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Everything's kind of swaddled in there. It's their little baby bundle. They can just grab them. Um, Deanna, did you want to unmute? I see you there. Um, yeah, I think I just unmuted, sorry. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm from the East Coast and I was just curious, um, we have some limitations in visitation now and I was wondering how this is impacting um, kangaroo care. Um, if you were seeing some data changes with regards to that, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's actually, we have seen some decrease in um, breast milk um, because we're able to track that. We use a, an application for tracking all of our breast milk. And um, it would be great if we had one of these for kangaroo caring too, um, to be able to track it. Um, but uh, we definitely are concerned about um, this. You know, again, I, I live in Connecticut, so I uh, definitely have some concerns about it. And I was just wondering if you were seeing any impacts to the data. Okay, so for the data, I have until March, and it's, it hasn't changed. Our visitation is still allowing both parents to be at the bedside, so they are still doing the kangaroo care, so we haven't changed our policies, our family-centered care, and the leadership team. We still think it's a, a, the parents can come in, and they are wearing the mask, and we are allowing them, so our data didn't change. <clears throat> the next question I have is for the tracking, um, I would love to hear what you're using for the tracking for the breast milk. Um, so my other project is the improving the hand expression of colostrum. So we, we are getting that um, encouraging within an hour, expressing their colostrum. So it's actually, we are seeing increased um, breast milk um, um, production. So we just wanted to track that. So we have a different way of looking. So I would love to hear what you guys are doing um, for tracking the breast milk volume. Yeah, it's actually a um, uh, interactive. The family, the mothers, um, input the data um, on an application called Keratin, K-E-R-I-T-O-N, and um, we know exactly how much is in the system. We know how much they're pumping at different times. We're able to engage with them um, through the application with regards to pumping. So it, it's you know it's a product, um, so I don't mean to market it or anything. But um, it, we just went live with it a, a few months ago, so it has been really great to see kind of what what it uh, um, gives us as far as data is concerned. Um, but I think it would be really great if we had something for kangaroo care, um, just so we had something more tangible that the families could engage with too, because. Um, they actually are a big piece of this, obviously, and I think it would be great if we had some some way of uh, of them being able to participate in some of this QI more actively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is a baby um, March of Dimes, uh, my Nikki baby. You guys are all uh, familiar with that. There is a um, kangaroo care, um, so they can um, put the kangaroo care timing and they can track that on their end. Um, but I don't think there is a way to transfer that information into electronic health record, but it's definitely that's a way of, uh, that's how our parents are tracking the milk supply too, how much they are pumping and things like this. But I just wanted to have a system to transfer so we can look at the information. Thank you for sharing that. Great, great. Uh, Janet, I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself or Jackie, I see you're unmuted. Do you have a quick, uh, do you have a question or a comment? I have Hello. two comments, oh, sorry. Yeah, go Jacqueline, ahead. Jacqueline, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, I wanted to address, there was a question that came up about intraventricular hemorrhage. What are you doing during the high risk period for IVH? And I got word on Monday that I've just been funded for a new NIH grant where we are going to be looking at the measures of IVH, cerebral blood flow, blood volume, et cetera, and pressure changes from when the baby is in kangaroo care with his head turned to one side versus when the baby is in the incubator with his head turned to one side. And that's because our very preliminary data of two subjects that we did for the grant application showed that the chances of changes when the baby is in skin to skin, that is such a calming parasympathetic, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, treatment for the baby that we probably will not be seeing a problem for IVH increase, et cetera, or concerns that really were changing blood flow. But that's one of the things that came out of the Gravens conference about five years ago. So I just wanted to let people know that the IVH work is, is going on. And we also have a grant that got funded on March 19th that is looking at the stress of diaper changes because we have perfected a way to do diaper change during kangaroo care. So I don't have to take my babies out of kangaroo care and put them back for diaper changes. So it's diaper changes and all of their assessments being done off of the monitors basically other than the physical assessment look um, in the incubator, and we have three different positions in the incubator versus on kangaroo care diaper change. So wow. we're just starting those studies, and they will have data in two years. The diaper change one, we have one year of data collection ahead of us. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing it. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, Arlene, your group is already figuring this out, how to do this diaper change on dad. So you're... Um, You'll, you'll get, you'll have some evidence to back it up that's like robust science um, in a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things you guys um, have already perfected with your team that you've done is the how to transfer these babies in that vulnerable period so that you're not kind of saying, you know, we're hands off 72 hours, not touching, but that you're actually maintaining that, that midline. So are you, are you doing that with standing transfers as much as possible? Are you you know, how are you doing that? Because I, I know that you mentioned that you are. We haven't got to the, the, the standing transfer parent um, do their own transfer hasn't taken off in our unit like I was hoping it was. We did an education on that about a year ago. So we decided not to do it that way. We do it with mom sitting down. Um, we, you know, have a little wrap and then we put the baby on its side. Um, so we just transfer him to his side with his breathing. Mm -hmm. And then if, he, if you have the baby facing the ventilator and away from the chair that mom is sitting in and transfer that way, and then the baby will rest on mom on its shoulder. So he's laying on its side. So you never move the baby once. So you rotate it in the bed, go to mom, and then there on mom, we keep the baby in that sideline position and then secure him in um, in that sideline position. And so they're just facing the ventilator and keeping their head midline. Great. So. A published procedure for transfer was published in 2002 in Neonatal Network by Ludington Ho uh, because I had a federal grant for doing kangaroo care with ventilated babies. And most recently, you'll see a step-by-step -step with wonderful pictures in Birth Defects Research Journal, the September 2019 issue. The whole journal is about kangaroo care many outstanding articles in it. And there's one from nurses up in um, Canada that put together a step-by-step -step with pictures of transfer. Um, but the 2002 article does identify sitting and standing transfers and the data and the step-by-step -step procedure that we ended up using in my federal grant. So that data is also out there. And if you want any studies about kangaroo care, I maintain for the World Health Organization, the Kangaroo Care Bibliography. And it's over 600 pages long now uh, from every study that's been done around the world that's sent to me and I put it on this bib. But for example, if you wanted to look up transfer word document, you just type in, you know, in the navigation transfer and all the articles that are in exist about how to do transfers would come up on the bibliography, which is annotated. And then you can go to the original source and get the journal. And I probably already have it saved electronically anyway. So that's available to everybody by just emailing susan.luddington at case.edu, the KC Bib. All this information, all these studies, and believe me, the, all of this about out of the box is going to go in there too today. <laughs> she's already putting a spot for you, highlighted, and she's ready. Jackie, one thing, one oh, thing I also want to say, again, with that transfer, um, uh, some of the barriers were nurses afraid to do it because they didn't feel that the RTs were competent enough to, you know, you know, and I want question competency, but that everybody had a different technique about how we were going to secure the tube during the transfer. And so I think that working with the RTs was probably the biggest piece 
um, because now we have kind of a standardized way that we want all of our RTs to hold the tube. So one finger on the tube, one finger on the neo bar um, as we go. And, and that made it more comfortable for everybody because awesome. that you could trust your RT because the biggest fear is extubation during the transfer. So um, always, I think it's important to make it a with the RT department. Yeah, absolutely. Jackie. Okay, you guys covered several things. Um, first of all, with our transfers, RTs are mandatorily with us. Um, in our small baby unit, it's, it's a, a group effort. Um, babies are transferred without being disconnected from the ventilator all the time with a standing transfer. Um, side lying uh, until they're over their 72 hours. And then, uh, and of course the parent does the actual lifting, uh, leaning over. So that's been pretty successful. Uh, we're most successful in our kangaroo uh, minutes in our small babies, uh, yeah. not so much in our larger babies. It's interesting. Um, and the way we uh, are tracking that, there is a, uh, in our Cerner charting system, they chart their position. Um, and your choices are being held or kangaroo or whatever, and um, it's tracked by minutes. Um, and then twice a day, a task is fired for the nurse to qualify why the baby didn't get held, uh, mm. or so that's being tracked. Now, I'm not saying our numbers are great, but we do have some things in place that we could improve on um, with the tracking system. So. so do you think that you're finding what, what, what the El Camino group has found, which is just at, at they get to a certain age, it's more of the swaddle holding and you were tracking just the skin to skin holding? Um, actually, we, could, we track whether they're being held also. Okay. Um, but we find parents, once babies can be swaddled or once babies are uh, able to have that for thermal regulation or whatever, they really want to treat the baby like they're bigger and older, mm -hmm. like it's an accomplishment for them. Uh, and they want to see their faces. I mean, I think they really want to do that. Yeah. That's, definitely. That's definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the same with our bubble seat. We see the faces with our baby. Yeah. 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 So how are you guys overcoming <clears throat> the ooey gooey 23, 24, 20, 25 weekers who are in all that humidity and I can, shouldn't say ooey, but they're the gooey babies. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful new study that'll be out by Niels Bergman in about two months. It was just talking to him. And that's the one that was by, funded by the Bill Gates Foundation, where they have started taking all babies, including 22, 23 weekers, putting them right into kangaroo care within one hour of delivery. Right. And the results are quite phenomenal. They've been doing the study in four international sites for these micro preemie research is what we call it, the micro preemie. Mm -hmm. And the results are very astounding and absolutely wonderful that really show that the place of care should really be the skin to skin contact as it is in Sweden where the incubators are up at the ceiling and the mothers are lying on beds that accommodate queen size beds that accommodate their partner and the babies stay on the mother's chest until she needs to get up and go to the bathroom or visit somebody else, one of her children who comes to visit, in which case she pushes a button and the incubator comes down from the ceiling. She wow. puts the baby in the incubator. She goes out to the bathroom, has lunch, and when she comes back, baby goes right back on her chest as place of care because it changes everything and gets these babies home so much sooner. So, and, and then the, she sends it back up to the ceiling and they've been doing that even in our 2010 report, which was cited, which came from our international network of kangaroo mother care. The babies, all babies there at Uppsala hospital are within are in 24 seven kangaroo care within a week of life. Of, of birth within a week of birth. So that is working exceptionally well for them. And it's a certainly a philosophy that I was hoping family integrated care would be able to implement. But if you read the birth defects 
research journal article by Linda Frank. She says it seems quite impossible for us to get 24 seven kangaroo mother care going in the United States and Canada, though Vancouver Hospital is having a wonderful success rate with it. And there's also an article in that same issue of birth defects research about how well it's working there. Alfie or Arlene, what about these, these babies in high humidity that feel slippery and people are nervous about everything? I think the hard part is we haven't had a lot of them yet. Yeah. Um, unit. Um, so we've had three, um, but um, the buy-in was good. We only, um, the hard part we had, they went on the high frequency. Um, I think one of them got held before and that thing, but I used, uh, luckily we have the sister hospital, San Francisco, um, and they have lots of micro preemies. So that's kind of where I got the comfort level with our MD team and our nurses. They were successfully doing that. The babies weren't getting called. Um, we, we limited it to an hour right now, um, per our head neonatologist, the other units aren't limiting the time that the babies are doing same warm and all those kind of things. But I can't say we can say a lot about it because we just don't have enough of them yet to see what our buy-in is going to be and how well we're going to do with that. Yeah, I agree with Darlene. Yeah, that's where we are uh, finding it. So we limited to one hour, but I I think it's just a matter of everybody be comfortable. So we haven't seen many 23 week here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's why we, we don't see there. And then we go into this gentle ventilation of oscillation. So I want to hear if any other unit they are doing the kangaroo care or if Susan has any data about a kangaroo care in an oscillator. So I would love to um, hear from her and share any thoughts of or using the oscillator, kangaroo care in the oscillator. I can speak from our experience at Loma Linda when I was there even years ago and we had to advocate for the more flexible circuits for high frequency, but we routinely um, did it. Um, and then it's been a decade since, since I left there. Um, and I know Janet, you're on the phone and she still practices there. She could speak to if that's changed um, in that time. But I think it's exactly what you've done is A, you found other places that are doing it. You can connect those resources together, RT to RT sometimes, being able to speak and talk about that. I know Jane Solomon's on the phone or on the line and um, her RT, Amanda, um, has come to several of our one conferences and been one of our RT champions. And she's um, was very integral in their program there. And she's a fantastic resource from Florida to talk to other RTs as well about what they're doing in their programs. Um, so sometimes that networking, I think, is is really nice and effective because they can they can speak their language right they kind of they know each other they they know those um the products that are out there in that space really well um what we did at, at loma linda which i've shared with many of you over the years for standing transfer to get people over that was we used a baby doll so we kind of created a mock-up of a incubator a sick baby with all the tubings and we would actually have staff like you did but we'd also take the families out and share with them um, an opportunity to say, you know, we're going to practice this thing called the standing transfer and what's, you know, here are the benefits of that. And we would let them practice on the doll. And so, you know, just that whole idea of leaning in and picking up, being able to then see how the whole setup looked like, they found it to be so helpful. And our PT, Gerta, at that time, she was just the champion of that and it made such a difference to the parents to have that kind of stimulation just like for us to have stimulation um, we gave that to the parents and that that really helped us to get over the hurdle um, of that so I'll offer that suggestion just as something that might work um, and certainly it did work for us um, when we were doing that thank you yeah Sue. Well, this is Susie Ludington, and I have to leave because I have no, another no, one o'clock meeting. Fine. We all but, are like, I know this is always, I, I say this as an hour, and it's like usually 90 minutes. So thank I you all for being here. Thank everybody for teaching me so very much today. I, it was a fascinating meeting, and thank you very much. And let me hear from you and send you whatever articles you want. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. So thank much. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just say thank you again to, to both of you um, for being with us. It stimulated so much good conversation and, um, you know, just beyond grateful um, for the work you're doing, for the babies and, and for everything. And um, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. And um, I'm wishing I could be in Cabo. 
Um, so <laughs> we'll uh, hopefully be together again soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. You're welcome. Nice to